Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. British Christmas produces 83 square kilometres of wrapping paper, which is enough to smother the island of Guernsey. We also throw out the equivalent of 2 million turkeys, 5 million Christmas puddings and 74 million mince pies. With a total Christmas food bill averaging around £170 per household, over a third of us admit to throwing away more food at Christmas than at any other time of the year. Added into the mix are Christmas trees, transport, and you quickly find that the environmental footprint over the season spikes significantly. So when we are doling out the presents and enjoying Yuletide cheer, should we be more aware of what we consume and the impact it has? We dream about a white Christmas. Why don't we start thinking about a green one? And how on earth do we go about this? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined uh, in the studio with uh, Bruce Davis. He's the uh, founder and retail director of Abundance Generation. Uh, also here is Nigel Berman, founder and director of NigelEcoStore.com. That's an online eco retailer. And Julian Bora, who's a creative strategist specialized in sustainability branding. On the line, we have Colin Palmer, a member of the British Christmas Tree Growers Association. A warm welcome to you all. First of all, Bruce, I mean, do we consume too much at Christmas? Um, yes, I think we, it's got to the point now where it's perhaps getting a little bit obscene and the amount that we're consuming has sort of escalated over time. And I mean, what we've been trying to do at Abundance is say maybe don't stop consuming, but maybe think about the things you're consuming and maybe take a little bit of time over the choices that you're making. So rather than just sort of cluttering up our homes, and I think a lot of our customers sort of say, yeah, well, I've just got more clutter this year than I had last year, is try and come up with a gift that's a little bit more meaningful. Now, we've got a particular thing that it seems as though the big global brands are trying to take on the meaning of Christmas as just another way of getting us to consume more of the stuff we consume all year round. And we're sort of challenging the idea that, say, for example, the John Lewis ad gives us a meaning for Christmas this year. Uh, and maybe we should be looking a bit broader at what we're doing with our money. Um, and in our case, you can um, buy someone an investment in a renewable energy project and gift that as you would gift anything else. Taking the John Lewis ad, actually, Julian, I mean, you, you specialise in branding and sustainability branding. Do you think it's odd that there was quite a big furore or at least a lot of um, anticipation over an ad for a, a store that sells us stuff over Christmas? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, I mean, Christmas has turned into this slightly bizarre collision between galloping sentimentality and um, our gene pool imperative. I mean, we could blame all the corporations like the John Lewis's, like whatever, for, for this, you know, this need for us to consume way too much. A vulgar, I would agree with you, it's almost become an unpleasant amount. But sadly, that I have to deal a lot with the human imperative that exists under this. There is a basic gene pool need that we think we, the more stuff we have, the further up the gene pool consideration list we get more chance of immortal genes. And people like John Lewis, I think, sadly, just use that against us um, and uh, are able to create these huge surges of interest in something that actually, to the point made earlier, is quite vulgar. Can you explain the gene pool, the, the gene pool theory? It's one I haven't heard before. You mean that we, uh, we basically want to surround ourselves with more and more possessions because that makes us feel better about ourselves? Or? If you go back to a quite primal level, as you improve your own performance as a creature, as a species, uh, and utilise the different tools and attributes that make you more likely to survive, protect, um, nurture, feed, you become more attractive as a mate. Now, we just have our own human, slightly bizarre version of that, which has taken all the old useful skills of being able to thrive uh, uh, under duress, um, raise families, find food, and that seems to have been kind of mutated into this thing that goes, I've got a shinier car, I've got a bigger house, I've got more tech kit. And so we've got a kind of strange, weird version of it. And I think that's what all these ads feed on. There's, it's a little bit of, I don't want to look less than someone else, uh, and I don't want my kids to feel less than someone else. But there's also this thing underlying all of us, which is, I want to be the best I can be. So this aspirational aspect to advertising is, is, is kind of preying on this kind of deep-rooted psychological need and advertising companies and, and so on are, are exploiting that, do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I think definitely there's a massive exploitation of people's sentimentality at Christmas. Nigel, you're um, the founder of, eco, of the eco-retailer, Nigel's Eco Store. Do you think that we're more materialistic, say, now when we see these John Lewis ads and so on than we were 25 years ago, a generation ago? Are we becoming more obsessed with um, owning stuff and buying stuff and having the latest gadgets which you can give at Christmas? I think we are. I, I think that um, you know, bigger retailers have become very clever and 
you know, the, the new advertising campaigns are very much about plugging into our emotions and how we feel. And I think they're very clever and very sentimental. There's more stuff around. I think, you know, the latest gadgets and companies that are producing things, you know, we feel like we have to have the latest thing, many of us, uh, when it comes up. But it's a lot of it is around advertising. And I would encourage people to take some time and take a breath. Oh, it's been doing. I think 1930 was when Coke... So the, the seminal ad really is um, Coca-Cola's Father Christmas and so what they'd, they'd understood in the 1920s the advertising industry developed a lot of techniques for understanding um, how to move cultures um, it was actually developed in the First World War it was a way of getting people to give war bonds and they sort of took that understanding to turn it into global capitalism and the understanding people's motivations was key and what they saw in Christmas was a time when people give and that's quite an interesting thing to do with consumer normally consumerism is about yourself and about you know being more quite selfish really and just meeting your own needs but they realized there's an even bigger opportunity which is that people give to others much more than they actually would feed for themselves there's a kind of limit to yourself you get essentially get so fat you can't move I'm an anthropologist I spent a lot of my time in people's houses that's where some of the ideas for abundance came from and watching them consume and if you watch a mother in particular she does not consume for herself she has a sort of certain part of her life she consumes for herself usually locked in the bathroom with with some candles and a bit of soap and everything else and some music but mainly she's consuming to show her love for her children and coke kind of realized this and it's a massive huge infinite need because the point about giving love is that you want more recognition for having given love so you'll consume all sorts of products to create that experience so at that moment coke stopped being a bottle of coke it started being a way of showing that you love someone and the point about wanting to show that you love someone is you'll keep doing it and keep doing it because it makes you feel good no matter how high you are on the sugar and the caffeine in order to achieve that experience so it's sort of that was the sort of seminal moment where I suddenly stopped consuming these brands because of need and I started to actually start to try and create meaning with them such that then and that's why it's so important that Father Christmas is holding the bottle of coke they're saying we are absolutely integral to what Christmas means that's such that you know now we almost call, you know, call the starting gun on Christmas which is when you start seeing the first Christmas ads well, that's not Christmas. And so Santa Claus is actually the, the fact that he wears a red suit, that's simply because it was Coca-Cola branding from way back then? I imagine there were a couple of choices, and they presented the green Santa, and they presented the red one, and the Coke guys go, we'll go with the red one. <laughs> so, um, and always, It feels um, more Christmassy, though, doesn't it? Well, it does, because they then spent probably $1 billion to remind us that Christmas is red and white, you know, mm. such that you're now, in the same way, if I show you a pair of golden arches, you'll think of McDonald's. You know, it is, it's brand recognition. And all we're trying to do is if you want to reclaim Christmas, you've actually got to play branding at the same game and say, we will reclaim Christmas as green by having a green Santa. I know yeah, we'll put them in a head to head and in a fight, the green Santa will win because he's, he's generally portrayed as being quite sprightly. He's a little bit younger and he certainly hasn't been drinking Coke for 60 years. So I think, so I think actually if we could get... So what we're leading to is celebrity smackdown between <laughs> green Santa and red Santa. <laughs> But, um, Julian, just on following on this point, I mean, effectively, Bruce is saying that um, there's a kind of selflessness in consumption because there's only a limit to how much you can consume. And actually, Christmas is kind of tapping into that selflessness rather than the selfishness that we kind of associate that, with excessive consumption. That, that's definitely one of the insights that sits right at the centre of it and is utilised by a number of people in a number of different ways. Uh, I, I referred to something recently where we were talking about how we choose to live our lives and how we consume the life that we lead. And I have this feeling that I think that we all permanently struggle to find meaning within our means these days. It, we've just been configured into feeling that we always have to reach beyond the means of ourselves personally, financially, spiritually, to find meaning for ourselves. Uh, and I think it's very difficult with all of these brands around through the rest of the year actually being able to find meaning within your own means. And I think the other thing is, you know, we spend most of the year trying to live this slightly larger than life life. You know, it's almost like th this crossover where the movie stars have come down off the screen and we think they're it, uh, and we've become it. We all feel the need to live this kind of superstar okay. larger I'm than life. I'm not sure if that's true. Sorry to interrupt. But well, I think for the mass it is. Uh, I think there, there's an enormous number of people that still really struggle to climb out of 85 plus percent people who just go ethical, eco, sustainably sourced or rooted products are just not my priority. They are, they're a first world, upper middle class luxury that I really can afford. 
um, for whatever the reason, they seem because to be able to Nigel, your it. response to that, I mean, you're an eco-retailer. Well, I, so. think, I think that people think that eco-products are more expensive. Oft, but they're not always, and, and often it's about saving energy. It'll, you know, it will save you money in, in the longer run. So um, We're trying to reframe that. I, think, I totally agree. I think that there was a point where buying green energy, for example, was a bit like buying organic mushrooms. You know, you did it, you did it for the premium, and good energy used to be at a premium to the market. Now they're not. You know, now they're the electricity almost electricity are cheaper. E- exactly, exactly. Exit. So they've proven you can do it. You can source ethically, you can source sustainably and compete in the market. And I think we're always challenged, the green industry is always challenged that we're a sort of subsidized industry and we're sort of there to essentially make people feel good about their lives. And we always come back and say, look, in twenty years' time you're gonna thank us that we built this stuff when gas prices are three times what they are now and we can't afford to heat our homes. Those people that have got solar panels on their roofs and thirty percent of their energy is coming from the sun for free are going to be sitting pretty and thinking, actually, I made a really good economic decision. Um, and the really good economic decision was to back sustainability. For me, we've got to reframe the discussion so that, you know, to, to the point about the word eco, you know, the word eco has become, to me, a sort of proxy for expensive. Um, we're trying to even re-educate the Treasury that that's the case. We're saying that this country won't be competitive in 20 years' time Absolutely. unless we um, actually just develop these technologies which in the long run are cheaper. And, and it's that long view that we're trying to take. You know, an investment in renewable energy is a 20 to 25 year investment. And this is the point I think about Christmas is that we've, we've got, got obsessed with Christmas in the now, Christmas as it is now. We're not celebrating a tradition. We're always just trying to have a more rich, more, uh, and ultimately overdo it, <laughs> a more rich experience <laughs> in the moment. What about the environmental footprint? I'll bring in Colin Palmer. You're uh, a member of the British uh, Christmas Tree Growers Association. You grow Christmas trees on a, on a small holding in Her- Herefordshire. Is the reason you do that because you're concerned of the carbon footprint that we, uh, that we leave over this period of the year? That has come as a, as a secondary effect. Uh, it's now quite an important effect, but initially it certainly wasn't. Initially, uh, as with, I think, many other small growers, we uh, had a hectare of ground and we thought, what should we do with it? And as I work in the forestry industry and, and uh, know and enjoy trees, then uh, trees it was. And I suppose Christmas trees, um, as a relatively short rotation, it means that you can actually uh, get some economic benefit as a grower uh, you know, six or seven years after you've started to grow them. So my initial thoughts were really, how can I nicely use a hectare of ground? But once you get into it, then, of course, your strategies evolve around the understanding that the more sustainably you grow your trees, the cheaper it is to grow the trees. Because if you work with nature, then nature actually will sort out most of your problems for you. So your strategy develops along those lines. And how has your strategy developed over the years? I mean, you're saying that you're growing them more sustainably now than you were when you first started. Well, certainly. uh, I think there's a a pretty steep learning curve, as anyone who who starts growing Christmas trees will will tell you. Uh, Initially, you get all sorts of things wrong. The the classic thing was you grow trees, say, for four years, they're looking nice, and then all of a sudden, in, uh, in July, they start to go brown. People don't want brown trees. What can I do about it? And uh, you consult an expert, and he says, well, what you've got is aphids. So what do you do about the aphids? You know, going back you know, 30 years, we used to uh, put all sorts of rather nasty insecticides on. Uh, very broad spectrum, killed all the aphids, but of course they also killed all the predators. So now we are much more circumspect. Yes, we still use insecticides, but we will use them when um, the predator population are largely either in the egg stage or hibernating out of the way, and we will use insecticides which are very, very selective, i.e. they only kill, shall we say, the aphids or the mite eggs. And, and therefore, it is leaving our beneficial insects to actually chobble up all the, uh, all the remainder of the, uh, of the pests. And that has, again, a, um, a follow-on effect in that by leaving uh, some of the insects on the trees for the beneficials to, uh, to chobble up, it means that actually your bird population also flourishes. Um, I mean, every time I uh, go out and work in the trees, I will find the tits, the, uh, the robins, the uh, linnets, goldcrests, they'll all be there chirping away. And it's, it's surprising how much wildlife uh, a commercial Christmas tree plantation will sustain. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. We're discussing how to have a green Christmas. With me in the studio is Nigel Berman, founder of nigelsecostore.com, 
Bruce Davis, Retail Director of Abundance Generation, that's a group which deals with renewable energy projects. Julian Bora, Creative Strategist specialising in sustainability branding. And on the line, Colin Palmer from the British Christmas Tree Growers Association. And do you think perhaps if people realised these knock-on benefits that they would perhaps be more inclined to buy a, a real Christmas tree as opposed to a fake one? I think it comes back to, to what one of your early speakers was saying, is, is uh, do people, when making a purchase, do they think environment first, or does that come on as, a, as an ancillary thought? My suspicion is that most people buy a real Christmas tree because of the tradition. I mean, in reality, it's a really weird thing to do. Why the heck should, should any sane person want to cut a tree, bring it in their living room for three or four weeks, and then you know, take it out and, uh, and burn it? It's really a, a very odd tradition. However, it's a tradition we've got, and actually there are some real environmental benefits that come as part of, uh, as a result of that tradition. I mean, if you have a, a fake tree, the tree can last potentially 20 years. I don't know. I mean, what is the environmental impact of that? Is okay. it fake versus uh, real? So let's take our, our fake tree, which, uh, which lasts possibly, well, it may last 20 years, but how many people actually keep it for 20 years? There's, there's a thing called fashion, and fashions change. And, and if you bought your tree in 1993, I think you feel a bit embarrassed about putting it up now because the fashion has moved on so much. So I would say that, that the likelihood is that a lot of people change their trees uh, at least every five years. But in terms of, uh, of the uh, environmental footprint, yeah, of course, you know, one could argue that one truck uh, to the supermarket to buy a tree every five years is going to give you a, a lower CO2 uh, emissions imprint for, from travel than, than going every year to buy a real tree. Bruce Davis, uh, I suppose the carbon footprint is something that we do, we're more aware of at this time of year. I mean, how bad is it? You know that we, you, you, your view is that we consume too much, but what about our carbon footprint? Are we, are we should be concerned equally about that. I, I wish we were. I mean, I think um, people find the idea of carbon footprint slightly strange because it's, it's a bit like making people feel guilty for something that they think is doing something nice, like having a Christmas. Um, so sometimes it's counterproductive. It's sort of like a little bad conscience on your shoulder when you're in the supermarket. And, and, and the problem is that you're kind of trying to compete with a lot of messaging, which is saying how, well, if you really love your children, you will do this. And so people will trade it off. I think um, what we try and say with, with abundance is saying, well, actually, this is about really asking yourself what you're doing with your money and, and the impact that it's having, positive or negative. So I think you know, sort of building up a sort of carbon guilt, if you like, I think was one way of doing that. And I think what people tend to do is, as with any type of guilt, is they've got short memories. And, um, and they're very good at de being in denial. <laughs> On the other side, though, if you say you're doing something positive, so our, our consumers get a direct benefit, which is that um, if they're invested in the wind turbine and it's windier, they get more money. And if it's less windy, they get less money. So they're making about an 8% return on their money for 20 years. But that, that varies according to the wind. So suddenly they become very interested in the weather. By being very interested in the weather, they start to sort of consider the fact that actually the environment is what's powering this stuff and that actually electricity even is something that's actually real and tangible and has to be produced somewhere. So you've kind of got this problem that we talk about carbon footprint, um, but actually we, if you ask the average person, they don't actually understand how electricity works. So they, for example, if I said you want to switch your energy to green energy, and I said maybe that's a, a Scottish supplier of green energy, that's where a lot of our green energy comes from, they're kind of worried that it has to be shipped in trucks down to their end of the country and then somehow put in the wires. They don't actually understand. And that was someone who said that was a... 30-something educated um, oil trader. A lot of us weren't listening in physics at school. <laughs> and, um, and But we're sort of expected to understand physics when it comes down to things like climate change. And, and frankly, people don't. You, know, you need simple concepts that sort of say, well, actually, you see this thing working. And on our website, you can see the weather in real time at the site where you've invested. We, almost, we also show what time of day it is. And you can see how fast the turbine's spinning. And then you see money coming out the other side. And once you start to make that connection, they're like, ah, these things make stuff. I kind of get that. And then I see that, well, if it's making stuff, is that good stuff or bad? Well, the wind is free. It's not causing anyone any harm. And I'm, I'm getting my energy from it. And I, I mean, Nigel, do we just, we're so concerned about having a good Christmas and Christmas cheer and that sort of stuff that the carbon footprint thing doesn't really come into it for the, most, for the majority of the population. I think that's right. But I, and, I th and I agree with Bruce that, you know, we don't want to make people feel bad. We want to make pe people feel better about what they're doing. And I, mm. I think having a real Christmas tree feels nicer than having something plastic and artificial in your home. Artificial trees do have environmental problems. You know, they're made in countries that are thousands of miles away. 
they eventually end up in landfill. You know, there's byproducts in making them of lead and other kind of nasty things. And real trees are much nicer. And in fact, we've gone slightly step further than that. If we've started selling cardboard tr- Christmas trees, and actually this year we're selling hundreds of them. How does that? How does that work? Well, it comes flat packed, and right. um, it's kind of pre-cut out, and you just kind of put it together, and it's got cardboard kind of baubles, and um, you can decorate it yourself, and you can paint it, and it's a great thing for kids and. You know, schools like them and some companies that are trying to feel more environmentally friendly and show their staff that they care about the environment as starting to buy them as well, which is quite interesting. I, I suppose, Julian, one concern is that you could have a relatively green Christmas in terms of you have a, you have a Christmas tree and you, you watch what you purchase in terms of what you eat and stuff like that, but then you buy an iPad or an iPhone or something, which um, has its own footprint. Should we really rethink of rethink the kind of presents that we buy? Up until now, we've been doing this thing where we're going, uh, we use this very reductive language to people. We hector them, we tell them off, you know, do less of that, that's kind of bad, this whole thing about guilting people. And it just doesn't work, it hasn't worked, it will never work. I would like to just try and get people to be smarter, and I agree with that point as well. I'd rather give them the tools to make their own smart decisions rather than have some parent-child conversation. You know, Inconvenient Truth was a powerful piece at the time. And it's done its job. Now we need to find a a new version of it. So, for example, I do a lot of work in this area um, about how do you reimagine prosperity. And it's about writing sustainable truths up into stuff that people care about. And I think the point about carbon emissions and footprint. In the UK, whether you like it or not, we're a carry-on country. You know, you say carbon emission and most people go to a fart gag. You know, because it's not, it doesn't exist in their world. They, they tend to find a trivial or light way of dismissing it. They don't really exist in that space. So I would rather deal with all of those kinds of um, topic matters, uh, topics and matters with uh, uh, an incitement to just have a, a smarter, lighter life and lead one of those and thus provide them with the services and products that enables them to do that. And if that is ultimately buy less presents, because, yeah, you only can see so far down the supply chain of an iPad, and it doesn't always look great. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing how to have a green Christmas with Nigel Berman, Bruce Davis, Julian Bora, and Colin Palmer. If people are encouraged to have a green Christmas, Bruce, they really have to have a green 12 months of the year as much as anything. That's true, although 60% of our consumption is at Christmas. Mm. And so if you want to make... We don't need to all wear hair shirts and go back to the Stone Ages to be green. There was a degree to which we did rather paint the picture of sustainability being we're all going back to the caves. But actually what it is is doing being more sensible about the way we consume. We we are consuming beings. I mean, we have to live to eat and and we have to uh, look after our families and make people feel warm and all of that. So we need to solve that problem. It's a technology problem at many many levels. Um, And we just, at the moment, seem to have a sort of a kind of one hand tie behind our back approach to investing in that technology because we've been sold some story that maybe this this whole climate change thing is a big hoax and yeah 97 percent of scientists are completely and utterly mad in reality those 97 percent of scientists aren't the one that's mad it's the three percent they still allow on television what we're, what we're trying to do there is say look if, you, if agreeing christmas is a really good way to start secondly actually when you think about christmas and if Christmas has become this idea, and I think well, some of this is about waking people up. You know, the, the John Lewis ad is, is a bit like a sort of analgesic. It's there to make you feel sort of so sentimental and nice as you walk through the store. You buy loads of stuff um, mm. because you're, you're full of all these lovely analgesics that sort of stop you thinking about the implications of what you're doing. And all we're doing with, say, a Green Santa campaign is saying, hang on a minute, it wasn't always like this, and people were perfectly happy. Um, so you can change what you're doing. And, I mean, just a very small thing. I just A friend of mine said, you know what I'm going to do for Christmas? I'm going to volunteer on Christmas Day. She's single. She doesn't, she's not going to go and see her family this year. So what's she going to do? Go and volunteer in a homeless shelter for the day. Um, and I passed that on to someone else. And now three people are volunteering in that homeless shelter. Mm-hmm. And they're all telling their friends that's what they're doing. So probably 20 of them will turn up. But the point is that they hadn't really thought about what am I actually going to do on Christmas Day that might actually be meaningful. So you introduce an example and you let people make their own decisions. For some people, Christmas is a religious holiday. For others, it's, it's about family. But do you think we should rethink the cultural meaning of, of Christ, Christmas, Nigel? I mean, if, if you're neither religious nor have a family, perhaps. You know, the meaning of Christmas is, is there all the time. I mean, you know, we, we, we kind of all know about the absurdity of the, commercial, the over-commerciality of it. But I think we know that it's a time to spend with family and that it's, it's also about reciprocity, about you give to me and I give to you. And I, and I think that 
you know, a whole world is made up of these kind of fragile networks around reciprocity, the planet and us and other people and us. You know, we're all working together, we're all connected. And I think at Christmas, we all, most of us get a chance to take a break, we get a few days off, get time to spend quality time with the family, you know, which might lead to some arguments, but <laughs> mostly it's a really nice thing and it's a time to, to sit around and think about things. It's meant to be a time of kind of rebirth. Um, and reflection and I think also another imperative that's going on is people's energy bills are going up and you know when you're sitting when you're at home all the time and you can see that the lights are on all the time or people have left things on you start to think about the cost of Christmas and I think that's going to have an, an impact this year as well. Colin you grow 10,000 Christmas trees if I'm not mistaken what happens when they when they're finished I mean are you looking at um, picking them up and, and, and returning them to the ground? We have an arrangement with a local scout group and uh, and they actually do that for us uh, and they, they charge, uh, and obviously it helps their funds, and then they uh, dispose of them in uh, an environmentally uh, sound fashion. Uh, but the other point, actually, the, the, the one other uh, area of this, of course, what Christmas trees are doing are, are locking up carbon and locking up carbon dioxide. The sequestration that's going on in the, in the plantation is, uh, is very valuable. I can certainly uh, reckon that uh, my, uh, my hectare of Christmas trees is, is covering my CO2 emissions from any car travel. I mean, each tree is locking up oh, anything up to half a kilogram of carbon dioxide per year, uh, depending on the size of the tree. They are actually doing some good there, as well as uh, providing some enjoyment for, uh, for the public. And just quickly before we finish, I just want to go around the table and find out what kind of presents we should be buying. Bruce, what, what, what presents should we be getting? Well, I mean, I think obviously we're offering people the chance to gift an investment. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is the first time that's ever been able to be done. So people can just go online and they can say rather than giving £50 of something they don't need, um, they can buy £50 worth of a wind turbine investment that um, pays them a return for 20 years. Um, and yeah, alongside that, I think there's also friends of mine on Facebook, they're just making presents. So I can buy the presents from a friend to give to another friend, which I think is a particularly nice thing to do. And Nigel, Nigel's ecostore dot com. Obviously, you uh, you have a vested interest in people buying presents, but what would you what would you suggest people get as something slightly different, something well, a bit we, left field? We do actually push a message of buy less stuff. But uh, if you're going to push me on the best Christmas presents this year, I think <laughs> they're going to be a cardboard rocket playhouse for children, a wonder bag, which is a power free slow cooker and an eco kettle which saves 30% of the energy of a normal kettle. Julian, you persuaded me not to go to John Lewis this year. What should I buy uh, for Christmas, do you think? Um, I, it's actually probably I'd rather you did something. The gift would be, uh, and I would say it to anybody, go out, find an old person who's been there, seen it and done it, and ask them how to just live a bit smarter and lighter and wiser and greener, because I think all the wisdom's there. We just need to unlock it. Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to finish, but uh, thank you very much. That's Julian Borer. He's a creative strategist who specialises in sustainability branding. Also here was Nigel Berman, who's the founder and director of Nigel's Ecostore.com. That's an online eco-retailer. And Bruce Davis, founder and retail director of Abundance Generation. That's a group which links up communities and individuals with renewable energy projects. On the line, we had Colin Palmer, a member of the British Christmas Tree Growers Association. Thank you all very much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London. 